Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Baggage. We all have it to some extent, but we don't usually unpack it on a first date. Jillian Lauren found herself without much of a choice, but where things went from there took her by surprise. Taylor Schilling, best known as Piper Chapman on the Netflix series Orange is the New Black, reads Jillian's essay, Finding Marriage Without Losing a Self. When I met Scott, I was somewhere between the before and after picture in a no-man's land called Cosmetology School. We went on our first date on a balmy night in the early fall of 2003. I had met him the week before at a bowling party, and he'd asked me what I did. I go to beauty school. Beauty school is hot, he said. Beauty school is not hot, I said. Anyone who thinks beauty school is hot is a pervert. Scott was not deterred. I'll show you, he said. I'll pick you up at beauty school and take you to Norm's. Norm's is a kitschy diner frequented by the senior citizen population of West Hollywood, along with the occasional rock musician looking for a nostalgic breakfast. Scott, who plays bass for the band Weezer, was the latter. The invitation to a date at Norm's was a nod to Frankie Avalon's version of beauty school. Scott saw beauty school as some kind of holding pen for gum-cracking bad girls who wore a lot of eyeliner and had recently dropped out of high school, which was not exactly accurate in my case. I was just desperately trying to find a career that would pay my rent lend some stability to my days, and maybe afford me some time to write in the evenings. I had only recently managed to escape the black hole of heroin addiction. I was entirely surprised to still be alive, and even more surprised to find that I was nearly 30 years old. So beauty school, in my opinion, was not hot. Beauty school was humiliating. Beauty school was penance. I definitely didn't want any cute guys popping by to see me doing hot roller sets in my regulation white smock. On the other hand, I'd have been a fool to say no to the most interesting date offer that I'd had in a long while. Scott arrived promptly at 5 p.m., and waited while I punched the time clock before ushering me out the door into his shiny green crown Victoria. The start of the date was flawless. He opened every door. He was inquisitive and polite. And I felt in my gut he was the rarest of things. A nice guy. Moreover, he was my kind of nice guy a blue-collar musician with tattooed arms and a gold tooth that glinted when he smiled. And me? What was I? I wasn't even sure yet. So I wore a dress that I hoped would compensate for my lack of other redeeming qualities, and I prayed that the past wouldn't come up before he had a chance to get to know me a little bit. We made small talk in the car. Then as soon as we were seated in our two-top booth and had ordered our sodas, Scott looked across the table and said, So, I heard you were a slave in Asia. Is that true? So much for getting to know me first. 
Where did you hear that? My friend Dan saw it on some E! True Hollywood story. He said they blurred out your eyes in the picture, but it was definitely you. It was true. I hadn't given the show the picture, but I couldn't deny it was me. Well, I wouldn't exactly use the word slave. And so, at the start of our very first date, it all came spilling out. My teenage years as a stripper in New York, my failed attempts at being an actress, the escort work, the years spent as a quasi-prostitute in Southeast Asia, my inability to make a clean break from the industry, my addiction, my endless attempts to change, the car crashes, the rehabs. My experience was that men generally thought a past like mine granted them permission to objectify me. I had seen it a hundred times. The moment I listed the catalog of my indiscretions, I automatically dropped a few pegs in class, brains, and general worth. Time and again, I had watched the relief in men's eyes as they realized they weren't obligated to summon their liberal arts college sensitivity training in an attempt to respect me. Scott was different. You know, when I said beauty school was hot, I was just playing with you, he said. I know that place is crappy and mind-numbing, and I think that it's great you do it anyway. I think you've got guts for trying to change your life. I should probably marry this guy, I thought. And about a year later, after one road trip with him, two salon jobs, three rock tours, and the decision that graduate school was more suited to my talents than beauty school, I decided to do exactly that. And marrying would be the ultimate demonstration of how I would turn my life around, right? With my wedding, I would get the opportunity to costume and set dress the climactic scene to my very own redemption tale. I felt an enormous amount of pressure to demonstrate to everyone I knew, everyone who had seen me so broken, that I was fine now. In fact, I was better than fine. I was loved. I pored over bridal magazines. I contacted friends who knew florists. I scouted for locations and settled on a grassy field in front of a shrine that held Gandhi's ashes, a stone's throw from the majestic Pacific Ocean. I was determined to design a picture-perfect final shot for my movie. In between filling out graduate school applications, I fielded calls from my mother about the items on the wedding registry I had just completed at Bloomingdale's. Honey, she said, I was looking through your registry and I have a few thoughts. Do you have a pen? First of all, you only registered for six mugs and that isn't nearly Enough. You need at least eight mugs because mugs chip. And my next thought is that the duvet you picked might not be practical. I took a Maalox and I tried to shake the creeping feeling that this wedding inspired in others the assumption that I had officially joined the fold. No surprise, as I had allowed myself to entertain the same assumption. With my readmission to polite society, I had implicitly disowned the girl with the sweaty, crumpled cash in her pocket, the girl in long sleeves standing on a downtown corner in the middle of the Los Angeles summer. And who cared if that girl, that huge part of me, was cast aside? She was a disaster of epic proportions anyway. Then again, that disaster had walked herself into detox, sweated through the sleepless nights, 
and somehow found a scrap of faith to cling to, even when there was no evidence to support such an act of hope. I understand why redemption stories ended happily ever after. Who wants to see a married sleeping beauty staring out the castle window and wondering if volunteering with Habitat for Humanity might fill that void where she once had a sense of purpose? You know, back when snagging the prince and circumventing that pesky curse was all she had to think about. But in my fairy tale, what it took for me to change wasn't one big vow made at one climactic moment, but a series of small and consistent daily decisions to behave in a more loving way towards myself. My middle-class Jewish relatives wanted to nominate Scott for sainthood, if such a thing were possible in Judaism, because who else but a saint would proudly take a tattooed ex-junkie, ex-prostitute home to mom and brag about her veggie stir-fry. With each loaded, you are so lucky, Scott is such a great guy, comment. I felt a little more of myself dissolve. When I stood in front of the mirror while my mother took a picture of me in a stunning off-white silk Monique Lulier wedding dress, I felt a tightening in my chest and tears pressing hot from behind my eyes. I wasn't crying from overwhelming joy, I realized. I was crying from loss. So not long after, when I learned that Scott's band had turned down a lucrative festival show because of our wedding date, I suddenly said, call them back and tell them to book it. I love weddings, but my gut was telling me that I didn't want a big wedding, that this kind of ceremony wasn't me or us, at least not now. So I bagged it, expensive new dress and all. Instead, I borrowed a friend's dress and Scott and I got married alone on a deserted beach in Kauai during a half-cloudy but still glorious sunset. Our wedding perfectly represented where we were at the time. Not at a happy ending, but at a quiet and hopeful beginning. Taylor Schilling, reading Gillian Lauren's essay, Finding Marriage Without Losing a Self. It's been seven years since Jillian's essay was published. We'll catch up with her after the break. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Jillian Lauren calls herself a compulsive oversharer, but she admits that having this Modern Love essay published was scary. I was new at writing about my life, and I had all those fears I think many people have when they do that, which is, you know, whose feelings am I going to hurt? You know, my parents are going to be so embarrassed because I admit a lot of things that I think— We get told we're supposed to be ashamed of. And what I found was that by letting myself be known, that I got much more support and sense of connectedness with the world around me. Jillian opened up even more about her time in a Brunei harem in her 2010 memoir, Some Girls. So what did her parents think of her sharing this story with the world? They were really angry. They were really hurt. And over the years, they have become really proud. And we've been able to talk about stuff that really was swept under the rug before. They still are not wild about this essay, but they do love my most recent memoir. And we wouldn't have gotten to this point if we hadn't been willing to disagree and go through the hard stuff. 
That most recent memoir came out in 2014. It's called Everything You Ever Wanted, and it focuses on the next chapter in Jillian and Scott's relationship, starting a family. I always knew I wanted to be a parent, and the same is true of my husband. And it was a bumpy road for a long time. You know, we couldn't get pregnant. We went through all sorts of baroque, you know, medical interventions and shamans and, you know, acupuncture, you name it, everything. And I could not have anticipated the road in front of us. That road led to the adoption of their two sons. The first, Teraku, an infant from Ethiopia. The second, Jovi, a three-year-old from the foster care system in Los Angeles who joined their family last year. Both sons have special needs. We like to say that parenting special needs is like extreme living 2.0. You know, we have these wild, younger lives that you would never guess but it's never boring. Like I, I've said that that's what I want on my headstone. Never boring. <laughs> We're people who really thrive under pressure. You know, we knew that adopting an older child out of the foster care system was going to be tough. And we felt like, well, who, who better than us? Like, it's not that we know that we're going to know how to do everything. But we're pretty sure we can figure it out somehow. Jillian and Scott have been married for nearly 12 years now. They live in Los Angeles with their two boys. My life is not at all the life I thought I signed up for. You know, the the glamorous life of marrying a rock star that I thought I was getting. uh, You know, the perfect family right away. But it's so much better. Coming up, Taylor Schilling on Jillian's story. On the Netflix series Orange is the New Black, Taylor Schilling plays a woman with a scandalous past. So we weren't too surprised when she told us Jillian's essay stood out to her. I really like the idea of being in constant conversation with the parts of ourselves that may perhaps feel the most broken and bringing those into the present. And that that doesn't happen in some big swoop of a magic wand that happens in tiny, consistent, daily decisions of choosing a different path. I thought there was a lot of courage in this story that I really responded to. Thank you to Taylor Schilling for reading Jillian's essay. Season 5 of Orange is the New Black comes out on Netflix on June 9th. And later this month, another Orange is the New Black cast member, Danielle Brooks, who plays Tasty. It is on like Donkey Kong, so make sure you tune in. And for the Orange is the New Black super fans out there, be sure to check out episodes 23 and 55 of Modern Love, featuring Alicia Reiner, who plays Natalie Figueroa, or Fig, on the show. And remember, you can hear every episode of Modern Love from our archives at wbur.org slash modernlove. Daniel Jones, editor of Modern Love for The New York Times, told us why Jillian Lauren's story stayed with him. You used to be able to hide your baggage so much more easily, and and now it all comes along with you, courtesy of Google. And Jillian's story is that in the extreme. I love how at the end of this piece, too, she talks about the wedding and the ceremonies having to do with love. It's very sweet at the end that they decide to have this understated ceremony and think of their wedding as sort of a promise and a hopeful beginning. I think we'd all do well to think about our weddings in that way. Coming up next week on Modern Love, Griffin Dunn of the Amazon series I Love Dick reads a story about a breakup in the days before you could follow your ex on Instagram. Here I was in Europe, weeping in front of relics for all the wrong reasons, and she was gallivanting around Chicago meeting people? It seemed ludicrous to admit that I somehow thought she might hang around Peoria waiting for me. But that was, it occurred to me, exactly what I expected. 
Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. Additional sound design this week by Matt Reed and extra help from producer Catherine Brewer. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.